Good evening. I'm Bill Hainer, Chair of the Arlington School Committee. This open meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020. Due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have, have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of the public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Arlington School Committee is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and that take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All of the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials, are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard or the town, on the town website. And we recommend that the members of the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus, unless I, the chair, notes otherwise. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I will uh, invite members to raise their hand and seek questions, comment, or motions. Please hold until your name is called further. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Permit me to confirm that all members of per and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Affirmative. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Ampey. Yes. Mr. Cardin. I see Mr. Cardin. Just wave. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, Ms. Morgan. Yes, thank you. Dr. Bodie. Present. Dr. McNeil. Yes. Mr. Spiegel. Yes. Mr. Mason. Present. Is Ms. Elmo with us tonight? She's not. She's not even. Okay. Here. Thank you. Uh, Juliana Keys, the Arlington Education Association representative. Yes. Dr. Jenger. Here. Great. Okay. The first item on the agenda uh, tonight is school choice public hearing. It is the policy of the school district not to admit non-resident students under the terms and conditions of the inter-district school choice law. This decision must be reaffirmed annually prior to June 1st by a vote of the school committee following a public hearing. Do any of the members wish to speak on this before I call the vote? If you do, just raise your hand and I will call on you. If not, uh, we are voting not to have school choice. I'm going to call the roll call. Mr. So Hainer? an affirmative vote is to not have school choice. Mr. Hainer? Yes. I move that the Arlington Public Schools notify the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education that Arlington will not be participating in intra-district school choice because of a lack of available seats. Thank second. you, Mr. Schlick. And is there a second? Mr. Thielman is seconded. Yes, I second, yeah. And there's no further discussion as far as I know. Roll call vote. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Schlipman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Rampey. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I vote yes. It's a, a unanimous vote. At this time, uh, Ms. Fitzgerald, do we have anybody for public comment? No, we do 
Okay, then we will move on in the agenda. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, Arlington uh, report from Dr. Janga on AHS return to full in person. Dr. Janga. Um, hi, thank you very much. Um, I have to say that having heard that, uh, you know, masks, um, that, that, that the vaccination results that are, are so positive going forward, um, that the limits on masks are, are in the works. It's sort of a, in keeping with, I don't, we have had a great start. I just don't even know. I'm so happy to have kids in the building. I'm babbling. Um, you know, the kids have been great. The teachers have been wonderful. Um, a lot of things that we worried about have turned out to be um, pretty smooth. Um, you know, we've had over 85% of our students return in person. Um, and the trend is pretty high that after the first couple of days, we got a whole bunch of new emails of kids saying, um, I want to come in too. So um, we're, we're working on that. We have set up, we've actually done in terms of um, the way we assigned the classes, we assigned classes based on their capacity so that we would be able to absorb to students shifting in. Uh, um, so uh, we're pretty able to absorb kids shifting in to in-person. It's just a matter of we want to make sure that we know who they are. We get them on the right track. We have the reporting properly. The teacher knows they're coming. So we have been saying that it uh, may take up to a couple of weeks to switch people over, but it's been taking a day or two. Um, and at this point, we're trying to, if a kid wants to come in in person, we're trying to switch them in as quickly as we can so that there's not a disruption for them. Um, one of the things we found is that we were very concerned about was the traffic flow on the hallways. Given the way the spacing is with the block scheduling um, and the open campus, we're finding that the uh, flow in the halls is not that bad. Um, and we are finding that the one-way halls make the building a maze and increase the amount of travel. So as of today, but tomorrow we'll be piloting two-way hallways with everyone walking to the right, which is what I know they're doing in other schools. Um, and we're pretty hopeful that that'll work pretty well. Unfortunately, it turns out to be difficult to get those stickers off the floor. So I think we're gonna be going around with duct tape and making the arrows point in both directions um, rather than peeling those up off of the floor. Um, one of the things that's been working pretty well with one little hiccup has been the open campus. Um, we're seeing good cooperation with the parts of the kids um, in terms of coming and going through the sort of specified areas. One of the issues that has happened is it creates a lot more flow in and out through the courtyard gates. And so that became that point of access for the uh, outside folks who came in to the building a few days ago. They were able to come in through a door that someone else exited. And in our video, it shows actually the good news is it took them a while to get in. It wasn't like they just were able to stroll on into the building. But as a result of that, we're going to make sure that we have full-time supervision at that entrance. Um, the thing that some folks didn't understand in the letter that I sent out um, is that after school starts, all of the doors are locked and students are expected to buzz in through main entrance one or main entrance two. Main entrance one, that's easy. They've got to come down the walkway and we can see them approaching on the camera. But at the back, um, that entrance is right next to the gates. And because there's a lot of flow in and out, we really want to make sure the kids are being checked. We've been using these QR codes as a way, so uh, our freshmen don't have new IDs um, and the process of getting them IDs for this period would be pretty, uh, pretty challenging. So the QR code allows us to say to a student, let's enter your QR code. And then we know that that student can come in. So most students, are scanning that, putting in their ID, letting us know when they're leaving or coming in. Others may not, but when they're coming in through the gates, they either have to check in at the, through the, I'm sorry, through the buzzed in door, they either have to check in at that door um, or they can simply check in in person with them. And that's tough. It's a new routine for us. We don't have hardened entrances. We all know that the, the history of this building is it's got 55 doors and 33 entrances that they are not hardened entrances. Um, and the way we really have safety in the building is that our students report people who are inappropriate and our staff report people who are inappropriate. And so we are really reminding students that that's important because, you know, if we were lucky, it was just someone coming in. We suspect to deal drugs, but um, it was someone coming into the building briefly and then leaving. But we really don't want people coming into the building who shouldn't be there. Um, we had the infrastructure trial today, um, which was. A uh, kind of a challenge with the uh, kids bringing in their own Chromebooks, dealing with the Chromebooks that we're giving out. 
Um, but we're, we're, we, it did teach us what it is we need to do going forward. And we are gonna make adjustments. It looks like it may not be necessary to have the rest of the school remain remote that day. So um, parents and the school committee should look for us to stop for a couple of weeks to update the schedule around there because we would rather be able to keep kids in and not have to switch remote instruction if we think we can do that in terms of space and supervision. And I think that's basically the highlights. Um, all in all, it's been going really well. I mean, I walk around the school and I see smiling, well, I see smiling faces. I see smiling eyes um, and people who are really positive. And you know, this is pretty much sufficient to get kids to be redirected when they forget that their masks are slipping. Thank you, Dr. Jenga. Uh, members, I'm not gonna go through a roll call. I'm just gonna, if anyone has a comment or a question, just raise your hand in front of the camera and I'll call on you. Oh my gosh, we're gonna get out early tonight. Oh, Dr. Dr. Ampey. We'll still get out early. Um, so I appreciate that you brought up the incident from a couple, I mean, from last week or whenever it was. Um, I know that it's a topic of concern among parents. It seems more so among parents who do not actually have kids in the school, I mean, in the high school right now. I'm trying to figure out how I can ask questions about safety measures without basically displaying our hand. But I guess, have we, besides the additional staff at the door, have we done anything else to increase um, safety to increase to decrease the chances of someone coming in well i mean so in the letter you know what we have reminded students is that you know propping doors allowing other people to come in when you're leaving um, is really an issue that people should report folks that shouldn't be in the building um, so we've increased vigilance there we've shifted our duties to a focus more on um, particularly because the hallway issue in terms of kids lingering in hallways or being unmasked is less of an issue. So we've shifted our duty personnel to watching um, entrances more. Um, I, I will say that if anyone out there is concerned, we have open paraprofessional positions and the more folks we could get to help us cover the spaces, the better. Um, you know, other than that, um, you know, we've had police presence around for these last few days um, and the, the case itself is resolved. So it's really more of an issue of, it revealed sort of this issue around the new flow. Um, and we're really trying to, for, to, to make it so that the kids, I mean, the new building is designed so there's two points of entrance and exit. So it's very easily supervised. This one, we've really been trying to emphasize and to push the kids to make it easy to go in and out through those spaces that we can supervise. Um, and so now we're trying to make sure that we're really limiting anybody coming in any other place. So the space that they came in was the place that we knew was the most porous. So we're watching that now. Okay. Um, but Thank I, I will much. emphasize this because I had a long conversation with our with with our police with our SRO and mm -hmm. our, our court liaison and you know about kind of the way we do security. And it's really important to recognize and understand that security in buildings like the high school is about how people behave, right? We could lock every door, um, and if kids prop them open, they're open. Right. And if kids don't prop them open, they are. And in some ways, you know, we could try to make, you know, we could, we could set up big pylons and have people scan in, although I'd need, um, you know, a ton of staff and, and construction to do it. But the reality is if kids don't want to come in that way, they can come in the back door. Right. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that will not be, we will have much more of that in the new building, but in the current building, it would be, months of work and hundreds of thousands of dollars to harden the entrances and it wouldn't really make us more safe it would just give us more physical control of the doors okay i guess the other thing is actually it'll help after the first week or so that people don't know everyone yet i mean you know they're not used to seeing each other in person they're not used to seeing each other in masks and after they've been there for a week or so it'll they'll become more familiar with kind of who's around and, and what they look like so i think that is true yeah no and and in just a few weeks the seniors will be gone again and so our numbers will go down and it'll really thin mm -hmm. out the number of people you're supervising yeah. okay thank you thank you uh mr garden and then mr thielen 
Thank you, and uh, congratulations, Dr. Jenger, on uh, reopening the building. It's, it's a wonderful accomplishment for our community. I know a lot of hard work went into it, and the teachers are still working very hard. Uh, so two questions. One is um, uh, a concern was passed on about the, the, um, the lunches, and it's working well with the open campus, but on a rainy day with 85%, you know, it's a little bit more than you were expecting, can you really fit everybody inside on a rainy day for, the, for each lunch? We can. What's funny is right now, because the weather's been so nice, that it's empty. Like there's the blue gym is completely empty. Um, and the cafeteria has got a handful of kids in it, but we do have enough seats. I mean, it will be an interesting experience. It will be much more, you really all need to be at your spaces, but we do have the capacity. Great. And then um, just, I know it's early, but how is the hybrid classes, you know, with the kids zooming in, working out so far? Is it, have we had a lot of technical issues or is it, is it people getting adjusted to it? Do you have any feedback on that yet? So we had a staff, I mean, the honest truth is it, 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 it's, it's a lot of work for the teachers. The teachers put a lot of work into it and they thought really hard about how to do it. Um, but people have really taken it on. I mean, it's, it's testament to the teachers that, we had a staff meeting yesterday. We went through kind of issues that did not come up as one of the issues that people were having. Um, our library has been getting out, you know, um, all kinds of anything that anybody needs to make their connections and connectivity work. I thought it was a good sign that when we told staff that they could be, that we were going to be all remote again today, I didn't hear staff going, yay, I can get back to my remote class. I heard people going, the, why? Why? We just got here. We just figured this out. Um, so I think that's a good sign that people are finding that they're able to be successful. And it, it is helpful that the number of students zooming in is pretty small, right? So you're not trying to run a class of 10 kids here and a class of 10 kids there. You're running a class of 20 kids here and a class of three kids there. Um, so it makes it really just kind of a few kids you're checking in with. But um, one thing I don't know, and I, I will be, we'll be looking to find out, is the extent to which we're sustaining, because if you are now only two or three kids, one of the things that the letter was, my daughter thought that more people were going to stay home. When she realized everybody was in school, she's going back, right? And there will still be some students who are remote and need to be remote. So we do want to make sure they don't feel left behind. Great. Thank you very much. Mr. Thielman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hainer. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Jenger, on getting the school open. I've heard only good things from people. Um, uh, one, so to follow up on Mr. Carton's question about the lunches, uh, are so is are you trying to make more tables, chairs, and stuff like that outside available outside for kids to sit at, or is that is that is that even realistically? We have about thirty five individual chairs that kids can move around out there. We have the bit the the benches and the sides of the things. Um, the kids are not. There are many many chairs with nobody in them, and many kids choosing to sit on the ground. Yeah, right. um, I, I I have a letter that I need to write back to someone who said my kid needs a chair to say there is a chair. She probably either is a freshman who's shy about going over and getting it or, you know, a kid didn't realize it was rare, but there are chairs and they're not being filled. So um, if I hear that there's a need for more furniture out there, we'll certainly see what we can do. I got the same letter, I think. Um, the uh, the uh, other question is just, could you just speak to to uh, cleaning of the building and just speak to um, a, a general comment that's been made uh, that I've tried to answer myself from a building committee's perspective, but any interference or any um, how the relationship is working with the building project and maybe just to allay any concerns the public might have about that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I have another letter that I have to write back to, which was someone talking about sort of it being dirty, right? And, and the issue is the floors are going to be dirty. Right. It's a school with a thousand kids in it. Right. And so if you put your stuff down on the floor, it's going to be dirty. I don't believe at this point that that is a result of the construct construction. Um, the construction, I'm I'm my window, which, by the way, has a gap about that wide in it, looks right out on the middle of that construction project. They are not generating dust or debris right now. It's fairly enclosed activities that are going on. Um, so whatever dirt people are experiencing on the floors is dirt coming from inside the building um, that we're in. The cleaning that they're doing in the building has to do with frequently touched services and the things that are really recommended 
by the CDC and just general cleanliness. Um, and I think the custodians are working pretty hard at it. Um, I'm trying to think of, and you know, and then I know folks have asked, there's, there's a pretty extensive memo. I mean, they, if you, if you, you have to look a couple clicks, but if you go both to the building project site, they have their regular reports on their air quality testing and other activities, but they also wrote a response specifically to people returning to the building. Um, and if you look in the FAQ, you can find that and click through. There's actually three documents connected there around cleaning routines and, and the, the stuff. But I think, you know, we're not going to pass the white glove test, but that's not because of the project. And it's not because we're not cleaning spaces that are relevant to COVID. Thank you. I just wanted to give you an invitation to say that. Yeah. So that could hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Any no one else? Uh, we're going to move on to the summer program plan update. Dr. McNeil. I'm going to take off if that's okay, unless Dr. McNeil wants me to say something. That's up to the boss. Bosses. Uh, you can hang around. There might be some questions about the MOOCs or the credit recovery. This should be quick, though. Thank you. Um, thank you for asking, too. So just uh, I just want to begin with some very positive news that we are fully staffed, not fully, I want to say that fully staffed, but we're staffed for all of the, we're appropriately staffed for all of the students that we have in all of our programs at this current time. So that includes the Title I expanded um, program, our ELL, the enrichment, both parts of it, both options, the enrichment program and the targeted assistant program. And I, and I do want to also highlight the fact that the program administrators for our Title I expanded program have been working very hard and they've been planning this since around February and that's Sorrell uh, Cohen for the ELA program and Abby Kaminsky for the, um, uh, the math portion of the program. And I also wanna give a uh, praise to Carla Busesi, our ELL director, who's work, been working very hard to recruit teachers for the ELL program, and Rob Spiegel for helping out with, um, you know, posting the various uh, positions um, throughout this time. So I have uh, generated a report, um, and I will open it up to questions right now. But I, I because all of the uh, details of the information regarding the programs I've covered in past meetings. So I will open it up to questions. Any members wish to ask Dr. McNeil any questions with regard to the report that you received? I'd like to thank you, Dr. McNeil, uh, for that finding the staff and uh, the job that you and all the people that you've mentioned. It's a phenomenal job. And, uh, I think it would have been hard to do just on a regular condition. Under these conditions, it's even that much harder. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spiegel and everyone involved. We all set? I, I would just like to thank- uh, Go right Mr. ahead. I would like to thank Dr. McNeil and Mr. Spiegel for getting this done. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, absolutely. Yes, Ms. Sexton. I'll echo the thanks. And I also just want to say that I, I appreciate the, the written document. It helps to see how many students, how many teachers, the time of the program um, all in one place. So I appreciate you putting that all together for us as well. Sure thing. Mr. Schlickman. I agree. Nice to have the written report. Nice to uh, have the outcome. Just Thank want you. to let our viewers know that that report is in uh, Novus and it's on the uh, web page that's uh, on the town web page as well as uh, for the on the agenda. It's available. And, 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 I, and I will I will add that uh, I just want to let since you said that to the public that this is a fluid situation. We have parents that are reaching out to uh, the program coordinators on a daily basis um, asking for, um, you know, if their children can be a part of the program. So the information, the data inside the, the report is going to change uh, with time. And uh, I, I will, I can provide another updated report when you know a lot of the information has changed substantially. Thank you for that clarification. That's important. Okay, moving on. So thank, um, thank you, Dr. Jenger. I, uh, Mr. Hayner, uh, is it okay if I ask 
if I let Dr. Jenger know that he can go at this time since there are no other questions. You know best. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, moving on to the approval of Assistant Director of Human Resources, job description, Mr. Spiegel. Thank you. So this is a, just an updated job description for, uh, it's not really a new position, it's a title change for someone who's currently uh, the benefits coordinator and uh, HR uh, specialist in, in the office who really handles all of the HR benefits for the district and really is the lead person on a lot of our HR technology um, systems that we use. So this aligns, the title is a change that aligns with what the town has where they have a director of human resources uh, and an assistant director of human resources. And the positions, the, assist, the positions are pretty equivalent. So we thought it was a good time to make a change and align those positions. And it is a recognition of, you know, the person who's been in the position for several years, Kelly Piggott, has uh, done great work and worked very hard. And it really is um, aligns with um, kind of the position she has in the district now uh, that she sort of, that this role has evolved into. Um, there's, a, I think it would be a minimal um, uh, budget, really not much of a budget uh, effect. There might be a small um, equity adjustment we have to look at, but that would be that would be it. And then um, I think the position does say it, it would have supervisor responsibility. If you recall about, I don't even know if it was last year or the year before in the budget, we had approved uh, a position, a half-time HR, and a, a position that was really split between HR and payroll. And we did fill that position this past year, and that would be the person in that position would be the person that uh, the assistant director would have supervisory responsibility, mostly directing work for that person. I'll entertain a motion for the purpose of discussion. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, move uh, approval of the job description. Is there a second. second? Yep, second. Would any members care to discuss this? Uh, Mr. Cardin, then Mr. Schlickman. Thanks. Um, so since it's supervisory, does it, do they move to, from the clerical unit to AAA or, or what? So it's a non-union position. It, the, the position has been non-union. It was originally hired. It was originally thought of as a confidential um, administrative assistant for HR because of the, the confidential nature of the position when it was a first uh, uh hired several years ago and but that position has evolved but it's remained a confidential non-union position okay thank you mr schlickman i, I want to say that i appreciate the work to upgrade the position upgrade the title to align with the work that the person is doing i think it's very important to recognize the skills that people are obtaining as they're working with us and to upgrade jobs as their skills align with it rather than losing people or having people in positions where the title doesn't align with their responsibilities. So thank you very much for bringing this forward. I, I'm very appreciative. Thank you. Any other member wish to comment or question? Uh, call for, for a vote to approve uh, the new job description. Ms. Hexton? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Ampey? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. And I vote yes, unanimous vote. Thank you, Mr. Spiegel. Uh, the next item on the agenda is the session of school committee regular meeting on June 10th. We only ha have one meeting scheduled. It initially, there, were, there, might, there was some thought that it hasn't uh, become a reality that there might be some conflict on uh, the staff recognition, which will take place on June 10th at four o'clock in the courtyard at the uh, high school. Am I correct, Dr. Bodhi, on that? I believe it's 3.30. Thank you for the correction. <laughs> we'll all show up a half hour late and the food will all be gone. Anyway, <laughs> well, I don't know if there's going to be food. So I, do, I don't, right now, I don't know of any need for us to have a second meeting in June at this time. Uh, it'll be definitely solidified. Um, if anyone has any comment about this at this time, I'll, I'll entertain it. 
Seeing none, we're gonna move on. Uh, the next item, discussion returned meeting school committee to the regular school committee cha chamber. Nothing to report at this time. And if there's no objection, I would move this item to the subcommittee liaison report and announcement area so that uh, we can uh, handle it there. I'll be happy to report on a regular basis on that if there's any change. Mr. Schlickman. I just wanna note that the CDC has significantly loosened restrictions, particularly for people who uh, have had, uh, who are fully vaccinated. So I think that we really need to start thinking about getting back together in person in, in our hearing room uh, with the proviso. The one thing we need to, to work on is being able to access Zoom within the meeting so that if we have people we want to bring into the meeting via Zoom, we're able to do that. So I, I'd like to ask uh, informally, uh, if we are going to be able to advance, say, a large monitor or the technology required to have a Zoom connection within the school committee room so that we can uh, bring people into our meetings. I will, report, I will report back at the next meeting dealing with the technology part. We also have the issue with the health department here in town. They have been when I brought this to Ms. Uh, Morgan, when she was the chair, I, I wanna say a month, four or five weeks ago, uh, she asked me to go check and the health department said no at that time. So uh, that's one aspect. Dr. Well, Ampey. The CDC has uh, radically changed the ground rules uh, so that uh, uh, we need to rethink and readdress this. Thank you. Dr. Ampey. So, in terms of thinking about this, um, I, I I appreciate what you're saying about the need to get back to the room, and I'm not disagreeing with that. But I personally am going to have some hardship doing this because things have changed as a combination of COVID and other stuff, and I'm now double booked on Thursday nights. And I've been able to make it work with Zoom. Um, if we can continue having Zoom as an option for regular participants, that would be great. If it's not, then I'll need, the problem is I'm not sure what alternatives I have, um, I mean, thinking of my the things that I can change. So uh, I'm just bringing that up as something. And Thank also you. just as we discuss this, I think we need to be very cognizant that we have had so much better participation from our public this past year because of Zoom. And I understand they can watch on TV and stuff, but I'm not sure it gets the same, I don't think it's as easy for people. And I think we need to remember that and that that is a really good thing. And uh, that needs to be part of the discussion, so. I agree wholeheartedly with that. Uh, just a quick example, um, the Arlington Rotary, we're lucky to have a quorum in the past. And now we're having like 75% membership because you could be anywhere in the country and participate. So I put it down as one of the things. And uh, as Mr. Schlickman said, looking into the technology, uh, this is, we're in the planning stages. We're in the discussion stages of this right now. So I appreciate that. And if anyone else, anyone else have a comment on this at this time? I, I guess what I'm saying is when you're talking about technology, you need to be at least thinking about the possibility of a regular participant via yes. Zoom as opposed to the speaker, which which to me is a little bit different, right? And and I don't know how you want to do that, but I'm just saying that there's two different things going on here. I understand it clearly and be very frank, we've just about worked it out for the rotary thing to keep the active people involved remotely and live. So we'll be able to share that with them. Uh, Mr. Thielman. 
Yes, I just want to make sure I understand the process. This is going to be referred to which is to a subcommittee to kind of figure out. I, I'm creating the subcommittee of me and anyone else that wants to join at a given time. I'm doing the research. I'm talking to the different people. I will make the effort to go for the technology and the space and the whole thing. Yeah. I've already talked to Mr. Mason uh, a, a little bit about it. Now he's going to hear more about it from me. Well, I, I, I'm just wondering if we should either form a subcommittee or refer it to a subcommittee that you sit on so that we can, so that we can, you know, members can talk about different issues in a smaller group. <clears throat> I think- Be happy to. Do you have a recommendation for a subcommittee? Which to one? Send you it to? Because you, you should be on it. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll join it. I'm ex officio on all subs. Uh, policies and procedures. Seems reasonable to me. Okay, so I move that we're- uh, What about community relations? <laughs> Okay. Because it it's okay. talking to people. Okay. Ms. So, Exit, are you comfortable with that? Sure. I, I twisted to Rob to take that position. I want you to know, and I told her that it was an easy, easy committee this past year. I little by little, she's getting more and more added to her. Okay, so I move that Jeff? we what do you want me to do? I was gonna say you're on that committee too. I so. know that, I know that. <laughs> I had a whole plan to get out of this. I, you guys caught me. Uh, okay, well, I, that didn't work. Okay, so <laughs> move that we refer the uh, question of uh, resuming our meetings in the school committee room to the community relations committee with a report, preliminary report due to the school committee on June 10th. Do we need a vote on that? Yeah, we probably. Yeah, we'll, go, we'll call it. Okay. No, there needs is to be there, a second. Is, is, is there a second? Okay, we got a second. second. Any further discussion? Uh, can I make a friendly amendment of honor before? Honor before, yes, yes. That's that's what I meant to say. Thank you. Paul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Honor. We all set. Roll call. Miss Exton. Yes. <laughs> Reluctantly. <laughs> Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thelman. Yes. Uh, Dr. Empey. Yes. Mr. Carden. Yes. Miss Morgan. Yes. And I. Four happy, three begrudging. That works. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on. Uh, MA, MASC Delegate Assembly Representative. Uh, is there, raise your hand if you were interested in becoming the delegate from the Arlington School Committee. I'm happy to do it if uh, nobody else wants to do it. I it, it, it it's, a good it's a good thing to do. So if, if you want to go and play, I, I recommend it. I move that we nominate, that we select Mr. Schlickman to be our representative to the MASC Delegate Assembly. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Roll call. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Ampey. Yes. Mr. Carden. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I vote yes, unanimous vote. Mr. Schlickman, did you want to uh, speak to the committee about resolutions? Yeah, one of the things that the uh, Delegate Assembly does is to uh, vote on resolutions that are generated either by the board of directors or by individual school committees. Uh, so if Arlington wishes to do so, uh, to submit a uh, resolution, we would need to have that adopted at the next meeting. So if anybody wants to write a resolution or has a topic they want to propose, uh, let me know and I can work with you to get it up to resolution form and we can bring it forward next uh, at the next meeting. Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for serving. Uh, superintendent's report, Dr. Bodie. Good evening. I don't think that we've had a superintendent's report this early ever. Uh, I'm the, so the, community is re, the community is recovering from the trauma of town meeting. And so we've got to demonstrate a good example tonight. That's what's going on. I'm going to stall for at least a half hour because I don't want to be held to this every way, every time. No, no but I, we want the town meeting to be held to this standard. That's what we want. Dr. Bodie. Well, you're all very tired from this week. So it, it's probably good that we're uh, having a, uh, a short meeting. There are three things I want to bring up tonight. One is enrollment. 
Two is the new uh, information on close contact quarantining and the return to school after quarantine. And then of course the high school project update. So let me begin with um, enrollment. Um, I think one of the, uh, let's talk about kindergarten enrollment first. Uh, where we are right now is uh, not substantially different than where we had been um, with uh, our enrollment uh, for the for kindergarten. So right now, um, our kindergarten enrollment, if you th there's two different categories. It's when they're approved when they're um, pending and when they're approved and moving into our school information system, um, i.e. power school. And right now, if we if we talk if we look at how many have actually been delivered into power school, there are 394. But when you add the pending, which could mean some you know, very minor or, or substantial document and needs that need to be completed, 443. The the registration office um, still is continuing to project 505 for kindergarten next year. Now, uh, I think Dr. Allison Ampey brought up the question uh, last meeting about where we are uh, with enrollment in general. As everyone knows, we had an enrollment dip this year. And so what's happening uh, in terms of something that would be additive to our enrollment next year. So right now we have um, a total delivered to the SIS system of 503. Now, keep in mind that we're going to have uh, 329 graduates very soon. So, if you were to think about a net on that, we're up about, from where we were October 1, about 179 students. And again, this is very fluid. That is actually delivered to Power, power School. When you look at where we are in terms of pending, and this is a, this is a, uh, a K-12 look at our enrollment, we would have a differential of 254 students. So it's only May and we'll see where we are, but if, if it could well be that by the end of this month, we will find that um, the deficit we had for, in October uh, will be erased. So I, I think this is one of the things that uh, the school committee will want to keep abreast of. It's certainly something that, that we are in the in, um, school department because it's really going to affect um, class sizes. It's going to affect number of classes, reserve teachers. So the, the situation right now is that this is fairly spread out across the, the district. I think that the enrollment as, as it's developing with kindergarten already suggests that we're going to need two kindergarten positions. They're not necessarily, I should say there's gonna be two additional positions. They won't necessarily be kindergarten because classes roll up and it may be that the, the actual need at a school will be at another grade level, grade two, grade three. So, but I, I, we can already see that that is definitely in the works. And whether there'll be more as we move along, uh, we're not sure yet. So that's where I will, I will get a hard copy of this out to you um, so you can see it. But maybe before I go on to the next um, topic, there might be some questions or uh, requests for more information. Mr. Cardin. Thank you. So um, where do we account for students that have told us that they're going to Minuteman or to a private school for high school or, or moving out of town next year? Um, that's, a, that's a great question. And I will follow up on 
um, the, what I'm giving right now is really just the numbers. So we usually have coming up from the eighth grade, it can vary, but if I was to say about how many, it's usually between 30 and 40 students, because we have about at Miniman anywhere from one, you know, in a given year, 120, 135. So that sort of gives you an idea of where we are. So it's not going to be a big drop in the eighth grade enrollment, but it, it is going to represent, and I don't think, in fact, I'm pretty sure it's not representing these numbers right now. Yeah, we had we actually had a long discussion at town meeting last night about oh, you did. because mm -hmm. because, um, because 98 students applied from Arlington, 98. Um, so and uh, there's there's 13 that are still on a wait list um, because they don't have space. Um, mm -hmm. So I believe there are 70 that are enrolled. Um, I don't have the exact number, but around 70 are are enrolled. I'm from Arlington. So yep. some of them may not be at Audison, some of them may be homeschooled or elsewhere, but mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a lot more than 30. Yeah, um, I don't, I didn't know the numbers off uh, from Audison, but I will definitely check into that. And we've had years where there's been more that have signed up to go and that's not what actually ends up happening. But yes, these numbers that I'm giving you right now, I am fairly certain do not include the Minuteman because they haven't been withdrawn from the system yet. And, and that could be a function of the high, obviously of the high school. Um, though everybody needs to remember that the STEAM and the Performing Arts Wing will be open next year. Dr. Ampey. Thank you. Um, Thank you for this update, Dr. Bodie, and I especially look forward to having a hard copy of this because it was a little hard for me to follow all the numbers. Um, are there any deadlines that people who are re-enrolling in the district need to be aware of? And how are we communicating this information to them? Um, the answer is there isn't um, a deadline on that. There never is. Um, Certainly, we would like people to, and we can to to enroll if they're going to return. And if you recall, Mr. Mason has sent a survey out um, back in the fall, and this is something that we can do is remind people because class sizes and and staffing needs um, are based on what our enrollment is going to be. So. Um, that's something that we had planned to do and we'll, we'll do that, but there is no deadline. Anyone who moves into Arlington that lives here um, can enroll in our public school system. Right, but I guess there's a difference. I mean, it's good to know there's not a deadline, but we still would like to encourage them to enroll as soon as possible so that they can so that everyone can have the best educational experience possible because it enables us to balance our classes better, hire enough teachers and stuff. And so what actions are you taking or plan to take to help kind of let people know that and, and you know, help push them along? Well, we're certainly going to reach out to the people who left the system. Um, what's important to also know is that any family that is in, in a, that's remote in the remote academy, that's not a re-enrollment. That's just simply going to be a shift into in-person. Yeah, okay. Um, actually, some people didn't realize that, uh, but we had some discussions about um, the ex whether families that were in the remote academy would just would stay in the Arlington Public Schools. And my understanding is that we, uh, at this point, I'm not aware of families leaving. Um, so yes, then we have planned to follow up uh, and remind people, um, as I said, we had done that earlier and we had gotten a survey back from them saying that which, which families were, would probably come back. And at that time, we had about half that were interested in returning once, and, and the caveat was for some parents, once we were back in person fully. And of course that will happen next year. 
Right. So I'm, I'm just thinking it's time to start. Yes. What I'm thinking is we're going to have to justify use of some of the reserve monies potentially if we're going into enrollment over um, what had been predicted. And the sooner we can do that, the easier, the smoother it's going to make hiring and, and decisions. And so anything we can do to help kind of move that along seems like it would be prudent. Well, what's curious to me in these numbers, and this would take some time to, to look at this, is that we're, we're actually seeing an increase in the number of students enrolling for next year. Some, some are actually have started this spring, but I don't know if these numbers are the same people who withdrew last year. It's probably likely that they are, but we'd have to spend some time with who enrolled and compare that to who left. But it's, it's interesting that what these deltas are, um, you know, they're uh, looking, we're, in terms of pending, we have something like a differential of 254 students. So I suspect strongly that many of those number, many of those families are in these numbers, but I can't verify that that's the case without actually going through, having someone go through all of them, which we could do it. Right? Ms. Bogan, did you have something you wanna ask? Yeah, I just had a question. So if a family withdrew their student, um, their elementary age student this year to homeschool or go to a private school and they're re-enrolling, do they go back through the buffer zone process if they live in a buffer zone or are you automatically sending them back to their school that they attended previously? Well, that's a great question and it has come up a couple of times already. Yes. <laughs> I always, I always get those ones that are right on the edge. So yes, tell us. Yes, it has come up and, and it has gone both ways. Um, yes, somebody may have been in a school for all of a couple of days. Um, and, you know, that would not, it would just depend on what the enrollments were as we were looking at them at the time we did buffer zones. And yes, there were uh, a couple of people who did not get an assignment back to the, that school, but there was also some families that did. So it just to really clarify, some, these, are, these are kids who, who were in APS for until March of 2020, and then for whatever reason, didn't re-enroll in September, and then, but are re-enrolling for September, 2021. Correct. And it's real clear as to when they were. I mean, we've had people who, yes, who had been in the schools for a while and had been in a, in, a, in a particular school. That was a consideration in their placement for sure. But if someone was only in the school for four days um, before they withdrew, that, that, was less, that was less weighty in the decision what was more important in that decision was the enrollment at that school. I, I don't understand how somebody would be enrolled for a few days. Like they came in September of 20, my years are messed up. And they came in September of 2020, were like, I don't like this hybrid thing, I'm out of here. And, and okay, I get it. So that's how somebody, cause I was like, I don't see how somebody could be there for a few days, but that makes sense. If they enrolled in September, didn't, didn't, didn't persist for whatever reason, and now are coming back for September of 21. Great, thank you. That's my question. Thank you, Mr. Hainer. Yes, that's exactly right. Anybody else on this issue? Thank you, Dr. Bodie, you can continue. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that you're all aware of, and I have sent out letters this week, um, yesterday to staff, and then today to families about the new guidance that we have received from the Department of Education with regard to um, quarantining close contacts. And I will say that the, the new guidance from the Department of Education um, 
aligns with Department of Public Health. Um, the DPH supports the, supports the new guidance, which essentially says this, that if you are, you, you, if you are less than three feet for a total of 15 minutes over a 24 hour period, then you might be a close contact would need to quarantine. But if you are at a distance greater than three feet, then you, you would not. Now you would be notified that you're, there was someone in a class or a school, but well, mainly a classroom that had, had a positive um, case, was a positive case for COVID-19. But that class, would not need to uh, quarantine as we have done through most of this year. The Arlington Public Schools are set up structurally for students to be within three to six feet. And at the beginning of the year, if you recall, we had a lot of discussion about this issue. Um, uh, our view, which was strongly supported by our health department was that in a classroom, um, if, uh, if there was a positive case, then the prudent thing to do was to have all of the, all, everyone in the class be quarantined for the, the 10 days return on day 11. But like everything with COVID, uh, we see an evolution of our understanding of it. We see an evolution due to vaccinations. And, and as Dr. Jenga was mentioning earlier, there's now a discussion about not having masks indoors in certain situations. So it's all evolving. And I think that's, um, I think that one of the, also the precipitating um, motivations to really look at this issue uh, had to do with students returning full time. So in, in prior situations this year, students might only miss the two days or possibly another day of hybrid but now students are back five days a week, um, they would potentially miss a lot more school if they were uh, partially, if only part of the class was a close contact or they'd be in remote instruction again if the entire class was quarantined for that period of time. So you would ask me at the last meeting, does this mean that we are not going to be sending whole classes or learning communities into quarantine as we have in the past? And the answer is that is correct. Now, will the school department need to maintain some discretion in certain situations? Uh, and, and, and perhaps the, those situations may involve more our really younger students. The answer is yes. And that would be handled on a case by case basis. But overall, in the vast majority of situations, that we will not be sending a whole class or a learning community um, into quarantine. What we will do uh, to, to sort of, you know, assure everybody of safety within that uh, classroom is that we're going to increase um, our pool testing. In fact, we may even do pool testing every day for up to two weeks, just to stay on top to make sure that, um, we did not have any transmissions in that class. To date this year, we have no evidence of transmissions and um, we've actually had very few positive uh, cases that we've identified in the school system through our pool testing. Um, not many, and yet we've had some, some uh, when you consider there's 10 swabs, in a vial that we do pull testing with, we've had 30, close to 37,000 tests um, since we began pull testing. And we've had just a few uh, throughout, the, throughout um, our K-8 school. So do we think that our schools will remain safe with this new guideline? The answer is yes. And we will, we will as I said, maintain testing to make sure that's the case. So that's one part of this. The next part is that 
we, we do have students and staff members who have tested positive, um, either identified through full testing, but more often actually from outside testing. And they, they have to remain out of school. Um, and we've had up, in, you know, up until now, it's really been the 10 days return on day 11. We are, we are aligning with the new Department of Education guideline on this supported by DPH and is that if you are out because you tested positive, you can test on day five, which allows you to return to school on day eight. The actual regulation says that your, your quarantine ends at the end of day seven, but for all practical purposes, you don't come back to school for the next day. So we are we have begun that and we will continue to have that be our standard for the rest of the year. So those there's two parts to this and, and those are the two parts which I outlined um, to both staff and parents. So that's basically it. I, I will say that I didn't have this information with staff yesterday, but I the new information from the high school is uh, a, a very positive with respect to vaccinations. As Dr. Jango was saying earlier, we, we see a very high uh, percentage of students who've been vaccinated, our senior classes at 80%, juniors are close to 80%. Um, then, because right as, as of until Pfizer was approved, you had to be 16 or over. So at the, in the sophomore class, the 10th grade class, um, the the number of vaccinations is 48%. But if you look only at the students who are eligible who are 16 or over, it jumps to 67%. So um, in that respect, you know, one of the other parts of the new guidance is that if you are vaccinated or you've had COVID within the, the last 90 days, that exposure for 15 minutes. So I think that all in all, you know, we're. I think I think that we will maintain very safe schools with these guidelines, and I'm happy to answer any questions or clarify any points that I, that was I made this evening in that regard. Mr. Card, then Ms. Sexton. Yeah, just to, just I don't know if you know this, but where are we getting the vaccination data? Does that come from down through the state or and matched up to our students? Or, getting, or? We're getting it from our school nursing nurses. And yes, uh, if you we are running clinics in the school, um, and have been, and we'll have four more clinics in the next couple of weeks. Um, for age 12. So the data comes from our school nurse nurses. Okay, I, I don't, as a parent, I don't recall being asked to provide that information. So I don't know, maybe I missed it. Ms. Sexton. Thank you. Um, so I'm just thinking about the new close contact guidelines and um, I've very much appreciated sort of the decision that a whole cohort um, would quarantine. And I, you've mentioned this, but I, I just wanna sort of reemphasize the importance of the younger grades of how close those kids are getting um, to each other. And even though the desks might be three to six feet apart, especially at this point in the year, kids are getting really comfortable with each other. and um, you know, are, are closer <laughs> to one another than, than we might even want them to be. So I just, I, I wanna make sure that we're really careful about the decisions made for close contacts for the primary grades, um, you know, keeping in mind how young kids um, might be with their masks and distancing and their own, you know, ability to stay away from, from one another. I, I will say one of those guidelines came out um, or the new guidelines came out, I, it made me a little bit um, uh, uncomfortable uh, 
for the younger grades. And I, I don't, I mean, I see six, seven, eighth graders were really close to each other too in the hallways. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I just want to make sure that principals and teachers are consulted when there's a case like this so that we can get a, a clear idea of, do we really think kids were truly three feet apart um, all day long? We agree completely. And I, I have seen some kindergarten classrooms recently. And yes, I would agree that they, you know, it's really hard uh, to necessarily maintain the three feet and you know that every day. So that's why I want, I, I think it's prudent, wise for the district to, you know, maintain some discretion on this. And we've actually already had a test case in this regard. Um, so, and we, we, had a, a very, I thought, appropriate middle ground on this. And we've continued to test and we, um, there, there's been no transmission. So I, I totally agree with you. And so we would have to look at each of these situations very carefully when they came up um, at the, for the lower grades, our preschool for that matter. So yes, I, to, I we agree. We do agree, and at the uh, at the older grades, I mean, they're 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 getting more comfortable, as you say, as well. That's true. And if you watch kids walk into down the hall or into school, you can see that as well. But the one thing about that is, it's also um, not for long periods of time. You know, you transfer between classes three minutes, so we can't keep track of of the all of the two minutes, three minutes here, plus for every single child, that's just impossible. So I think as we get to the upper grades, I think you know we can feel comfortable with our structural um, setup of our schools. They're certainly their desks are three feet apart. They eat lunch six feet apart, and we're maintaining you know good good safety protocols. Dr. Ampy, one day at a time. Um, I'm not sure if I misunderstood what you said or if you misspoke. I thought that you, you said, Dr. Bodie, that someone could return to, uh, someone who is COVID positive could return to school in seven days. I mean, af after a negative test at five days. And I think did. Is that what you meant, or did you mean someone who was exposed to someone who was COVID positive? Could we are not um, having, for the most part, that's what we're just uh, talking with Ms. Exton about. We're pretty much will not be having students um, identify as close contact for the purpose of quarantine. But th that is my understanding. Now, they can't be, be symptomatic. Uh, I, I probably should have added that piece to it. But no, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm confused whether you're talking about close contacts or people who were actually COVID positive, tested COVID positive. I believe that if they're tested COVID positive and they're not symptomatic, it, yes, they can test on day five and return on day eight. But they have to be not symptomatic. If they become symptomatic, then that whole gets, that gets extended. I will, I will double check that, but I, I'm fairly certain. Um, yeah, I'm having, I'm, I'm stuck in the DESI website and can't find things to read them quickly and, and check. Um, okay, that's. Dr. Bordy, when you get that clarified, would you send it out to all the members? Um, so, the DPH policy is a coming out of quarantine. Um, so the individual who receives a negative COVID-19 test result on day five or later is able to come out of quarantine at the end of day right, seven. Right, but, but when you have COVID, you isolate, you don't quarantine. Yes, when, right. Quarantine. It does not, apply, does not apply to people who have COVID. No. Yeah, you're ice. You are isolated. That's true. I, I and probably that is a mis. Let me let me clarify that. But thank you. Um, 
we we have all of our anyone who tests positive um, is that whole return to school, whether a teacher or um, a student, is overseen by a nursing department. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Barty, do you have something to say about the building, new building? I do. There's nothing else to talk about with this. Um, well, there's not much to say. Uh, Mr. Mason is can share the screen. Uh, I just have one picture I want to show you, which is actually part of the presentation that uh, Mr. Thielman is going to be giving to town meeting. I'm not quite sure when that's going to happen. Um, we, if you drive by Mass Ave, you can just see that we're just making so much more progress every, every day and we're watching every day. Um, so if you're looking at the, the beginning at the building from Mass Ave, this is what you would see right now. But, and then you can see how the design of that would be uh, once it's complete. So, we're, we're, we're really moving along quite well with this. And in terms of um, the, the committee work that's going on, an interiors committee will continue to meet. Uh, there's still some more decisions on colors and patterning. Um, some of the big decisions I mentioned last meeting about mortar that was taken care of. So the... Um, there, you can't see this from here, but this is relevant to the students returning to the high school. Uh, along the like where CVS is, there is a pathway that comes in and takes a turn the at the back of this, so you can actually still come in the front door. Um, you can't really see from here, but I thought it would be helpful for people who are driving by all the time to realize what we're actually going to see. And you're going, we're going to be starting to see this um, probably late this, maybe earlier this fall. So, um, but there's really not much to report other than that the, the work continues with uh, some subcommittees and Mr. Thielman is going to give a, a complete report to town meeting. I don't believe it's been scheduled yet but it will be happening before town meeting adjourns. That's that we do know. And the next meeting of the building committee will be in uh, early June. It's the first Tuesday of the month, which I believe is the 6th of June. Um, so anyway, that's my report on the high school and my report for this evening. Thank you. Um, Moving on to the consent agenda at this time, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be a routine and will Chairman. be enacted by one vote. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Go oh, right ahead, I'm sorry, Mr. Slickman. Yeah, just a quick question on the high school. Are we still on target for a February uh, move into the front of the building? Um, we believe so. There was a little bit of a hiccup recently with Eversource. Um, and some of that has been resolved. So what happens when there is a, um, a, some uh, sideways from the schedule, there is often some compensatory time that is given, whether it's later in the day or Saturdays. And we've had some Saturdays this spring. So at this point, um, I believe that we are still uh, targeted for early February with the move happening over February break. I have nothing that would suggest that, that that schedule has changed. If it does change, then we will report that out um, at our next or June meeting. Thank you very much. You know, what, one thing if I could add to what Dr. Bodhi said is that, you know, the, the building is, is a, about a million dollars under budget and I and Kathy can correct me and so can uh, uh, Tercy, but we have, <clears throat> we have purchased everything. Um, so, you know, we, we're locked in. This is, this is it. This is the budget. We'll make the budget unless there's a major catastrophe somewhere in the world. But, mm -hmm. um, Chris, you want to correct me? No, no, no. I was going to chime in um, that the problems that the town is seeing with DPW, um, that graph that they showed on steel prices, I think we managed to buy at the dip 
and now DPW is having to buy it thick and uh, it's helpful. Yeah, Dr. Bodie and Dr. Allison Appy studied the market very carefully and knew when to buy. <laughs> they just knew when to do it. If yeah, they did, they, they wouldn't so be sitting we here. Have a recession. <laughs> yeah, they just knew and we did it. So that's it. We hit, we hit, we hit, we hit execute. Yeah. Anyone no, but seriously, predicting that would be down in the Bahamas right now. Any other yeah, questions or comments on the building before I move on? I'm a little anxious. Sorry. Consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant for approval, warrant number 21239, dated May 4th, 2021. Total warrant amount, $996,689.95. Minutes for approval, school committee regular meeting, April 29th, 2021, and organizational meeting, April 12th, 2021. Approval of the annual E. Nelson Blake Junior Book Award given to the top 10 students with the highest GPA due to COVID. The recipients will not be aware of this award until graduation day, June 5th, 2021. Ms. Exon. Can you pull the 429 minutes? The, which, uh, the 29, yes. Anything else? Uh, do I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, roll call. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Ampey. Yes. Ms. Carden. Mr. Yes. Carden, excuse me. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I vote yes. Now we're going to take a vote on uh, school committee regular meeting April 29th, 2021. And the organ, I assume the org, yes. Uh, do you wish to speak to it, Ms. Exton? We're talking about the 429 minutes? Yes. So it says that Ms. Morgan opened the meeting, and I believe that you were the chair at the Thank time. Thank you. Shows that I didn't look at them, I apologize. Thank you. So just wanna make sure that we make that administrative change before we put them. No objections, so move. Approval of the school committee minutes for April 29th, 2021 as amended. Ms. Sexton. Yes. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Ampey. Yes. Mr. Carden. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Uh, I vote yes also, unanimous. Uh, subcommittee and liaison report announcements. Budget, Dr. Ampey. We'll be scheduling a meeting in the next few weeks. Next, next couple of weeks. Thank you. Community relations, Ms. Exton. Thank you. Um, so there will be another school committee chat this Saturday for um, families and caregivers of children in kindergarten to fifth grade. Um, the, this is, there are three more chats. So there's this Saturday, K to five, the following Saturday, sorry, I had the dates and now I'm, there they are. Saturday, May 22nd at 11 a.m. is for Metco families. And then the final chat of the year is on Saturday, May 29th for families um, and caregivers of students in grades six through 12. Um, I will be scheduling a meeting soon to discuss returning um, in person to the school committee room. And I also would like to find a time to um, evaluate the chats from the spring and set up a schedule or determine based on the feedback, decide what we're gonna do um, in the fall. Thank you. Thank Curriculum you. instruction, assessment, and accountability, Mr. Carden. No report. Facilities, Mr. Thing. Gentlemen. No report. Policies and proce procedure, Mr. Schlickman. In recognition of the fact that we're in the middle of a long drawn out town meeting, we really need to do a quick meeting of the subcommittee between now and the next full school committee meeting. So uh, I'll be sending around a, a doodle or some sort of a query of the membership. Shouldn't go more than 20 minutes. Uh, Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thalman. We meet 
June 6th, as Dr. Vody said. Are there any liaison reports? I attended the CPAC meeting the other morning. Uh, it uh, went well, it was well attended, and uh, they're, uh, they're planning one uh, in June. Nothing more than that to report. Uh, any announcements? And uh, any future agenda items that you'd like me to look at? As far as I know, there's no executive session. Is that correct? No, you should be coaching town meeting on how to do a meeting. You should be, you should be consulting over there. Look, at, I, I was doing great until I got to the, uh, the uh, consent agenda and I fell apart. Painter for moderator. I will, oh God, talk. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Is there a second? <laughs> Thank you. It's non debatable. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Ampey? Yes. Mr. Carden? Yes. Mr. Mo Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Hayner? Yes. Have a good night. Wonderful week, everyone. Be safe.